Hello, my friend, Mac. Hey, Pam. How are you, dear? I am fantastic and excited to kick this off. And as we've been promising our listeners and viewers from their YouTube channel, um, our videos, we we're going to go over some questions that we are getting because it's really important. I know our listeners, we are doing our best to get good content out there. But when you ask us very specific questions, it's super helpful. It lets us know what our next topic should be. And sometimes I want to touch base um, on the questions. And I and I say I'm going to, we'll, we'll talk about it when we're there. So I'm going to read off some questions that we have had online. And um, hopefully it helps a bunch of you. And we encourage you guys to add more. Please keep listening, keep right. listening whatever. We do check it ourselves. It's not, we don't have a team that does it for us. We're doing this. All right, this one says, Dear Dr. Marsman and Dr. Lee, could you please talk about displaced disc more? Can it be diagnosed for sure without an MRI? Can the disc be displaced if my mandible is jiggling from orthodontic elastics, but I can still open my mouth past 30 millimeters and have no permanent clicking? Only very quiet clicking and some noise in one joint occasionally. Wow, this person's really listening. Well, so I, I one thing I loved about interviewing the TMD patient is you listening to their story. And they'll say one thing and they'll say another thing, and you have to, in your mind, tie all those things together. Um, so we made, this is what, the 13th podcast we've done? Is this the 13th or 14th? Yes, and like the ones we've done prior are setting up the scene the background for being able to answer these questions because we've talked about this displacement we've talked about imaging we've talked about mri so the first question the i'm gonna let you you i've already forgotten what the yeah <laughs> what was the question that's good yeah, yeah. it says so what it's the, the about thing that caught my attention was the jiggling of the the whatever on the orthodontics, could it throw things off again? What do you think that the patient meant by that? I think that um, they're curious if with the new position of their teeth and the orthodontist is using elastics to help move the teeth around, can it trigger the joint to start having problems? And absolutely it can. And um, I, when you're in the middle of any orthodontic treatment, because things are in constant motion and the bite, the bite is sometimes crazy. It's like as if two, two teeth are touching, you know, and that's all that's touching. You can have your joints start to have problems during any type of orthodontic treatment. Whether you had problems that you are aware of before to begin with or not, things can come to surface. And if the orthodontist or dentist that's doing your treatment knows what they're doing, that shouldn't be an issue at the end of treatment. I just find all this fascinating. I mean, here we talk about bites having to be totally correct within 30 microns, which is nothing, you know, when you're adjusting a bite. But yet orthodontists, which I never did do any orthodontics, can have only two or three teeth hitting right. and not have a problem. So that's mystical. That is really intriguing. That's interesting. How can that, how can that, how can that be? Is it the forces on the teeth that change the brain and how they are interpreting pain? What is causing that? But even messing with your orthodontic adjustment can cause difference in your joint. So anything can cause a difference in your joint. Would you agree with that? Yes. It goes back to one of our earlier podcasts saying that it is the bite that puts your joint in a specific position. So if the bite is changing, that joint function is going to change. And if it's temporary, your body can manage that for the time being. But when the teeth are in their final position, there needs to be a good stable joint position as well. And that's really the difference between how I do orthodontics <clears throat> and how a lot of other people do orthodontics. Because Mac, I mean, let's just be straight up and open up about it. Let's open up. Just Let's talk about somebody it. Somebody at this point can make teeth. <clears throat> I mean, my God, for Smile Direct, you could just send your photos to Smile Direct and some random computer is going to make your teeth straight. 
But we, you guys, our listeners know better. It's not just about straight teeth. If that joint's not in the right place and the muscles are pissed off because of the constant compensation, you're going to have problems. And it's not just chipping teeth. You'll have pain, headaches, all kinds of other issues happen. But during the transitional stage, let's say you have a patient that has TMD issues. And in your office, you're going to find the correct jaw-to-jaw position before you go into orthodontics. Is that correct? Yes. So the patient asking this question, that might not have happened to her. That not might not be the situation that they're having orthodontics. The orthodontist must may have just directly put braces on to straighten the teeth without having a goal of getting the joint and the teeth in harmony together. That's such a good point. Like, how do we do it differently? How am I doing things differently? And that's how you do that differently. Well, exactly. If we go back and talk about the orthotics and the way we make them in our office, we are starting from where is the joint supposed to be? And then we make an appliance to make the bike. (laughs) And then we move the teeth into the appliance. So the appliance becomes a blueprint. It's like our blueprint to where we're going to put the teeth. And that's how our patients predictably go through treatment. And they never, even though the bite gets a little bit, you know, it's transient, things are shifting around. They might have a small little trigger flare up, but they never go back to ground zero ever because the bite's being held in a certain position while some of the teeth are moving. That's the difference. I know where we're going before we start going there. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> I didn't do braces, but I did put teeth back together again with the crowns. Right. And you never, ever touch a tooth until you have figured all of that out. Right. And figured out what the end result, the end position, end position of the joint, end position of the jaw jaw relationship. All of those are imperative. And what's ironic about this is that when you send something, when I send something to the lab, this is crowns now, this is not not orthodontics, that the teeth were not touching. So that allowed the lab to construct a perfect bite that took into consideration the trifecta. So that, but you still worked it out in plastic. You know, you always have your checks and balances. And in orthodontics, I'm sure you're having your checks and balances. Instead of just going in and getting your braces tightened or another band put on here or this or whatever it might be, yours is so much more coordinated than most orthodontists. It's it's a it's a lot more work. It's a definitely more arduous because of the precision that goes into that. In the phase one, which is the orthotic treatment to get people out of pain and get their quality of life back, this is in adults and late teens. Um, they're in that orthotic about maybe three at the most six months, depends on if they're doing some other treatment for their posture. And then we go into phase two, which would be orthodontic treatment, sometimes still crowns, depends on how broken down some of the teeth are, how late we got to them. Um, but then, you know, in, in children, I don't have to, they're, they're malleable. We're not so concerned about their joint posture because that's changing as their jaw is developing we're utilizing the airway posture to decide where to push, like how to develop the jaw. We're looking at the airway in the throat. We're looking about how much the face is compressed back or squished in. And that's how we guide our orthodontic treatment. Not just making teeth straight, but it goes either from an airway perspective in children and in an adult, a joint perspective as well. So if you're listening to this, more than likely you have children or, you know, you know about orthodontics. So I want to open up. I want to ask you a pretty sensitive question here, Pam. So you go to a regular orthodontist and you're going through diagnosis and you have your child there and the the, the, the orthodontist is showing you models of these teeth that are all crooked and shows you the same child and everything is straight and beautiful. And you go, Wow. But there's a good chance that this orthodontist did not take in consideration the joint and all the relationship between the lower jaw and the upper jaw, but it looks good. 
And like I've said in another podcast, there is an art and science to dentistry, but the art can't violate the science. So if you've got this beautiful post-op case that's locked in and the joint is in the wrong spot, what happens? That child is going to develop serious grinding issues as early as their late teens that will end up manifesting into joint issues that can manifest into headaches, eye issues, ear issues, postural issues that will then later manifest into sleep apnea. Absolutely. And TMD pain. Process. Yeah. So how can you advise people looking at a model on a table versus retraction orthodontics and expansion orthodontics that opens the airway? What's your recommendation? My recommendation to our listeners and watchers, <clears throat> is now that you've been listening, you need to look for doctors that have the right type of equipment. If they're using two-dimensional photographic images of what your child's skull looks like, they're not really taking in consideration the airway. And that's where we need to start because the airway, if it's choked in the back of the throat, we know that the face is compressed back and squished in. That should be the guideline to how much jaw development or expansion that child needs. It's not what Mac is saying is that you can't just say, oh, wow, thank you for my straight teeth. They're gorgeous because there's amazing orthodontists that do great straight teeth. But I can't tell you how many people I get in their late teens or early 20s, even early teens, I should say, that they're like, well, I have straight teeth, but my joints start to click or I don't. These are early teenagers saying I can't sleep. I'm tired all of the time because the braces made the teeth straight. But sometimes they're making teeth straight. They're pulling back the teeth. And if the front teeth are pulled back, it further pushes back the lower jaw, further causes compression of the jaw. And then they're like, well, why didn't they do it this way? And this is hard for me to say, but I say, I'm like, well, what did you ask for when you went in there? I wanted the crooked teeth fixed. Well, did exactly they right. fix it? It's true. They fixed it. So were <clears> they wrong? <throat> no, they gave you what you asked for. And I know you didn't know what to ask for, but that doctor didn't know what you wanted. And they're not looking at that child the way that you were hoping they would look at them. We're just talking straight teeth. It's not about straight teeth. It's about cranial facial development, good airways and good joint position. That's what we're talking about. The teeth are just gravy. You get all that other stuff, right? Oh, girl. They're gorgeous and straight, right? Right. And I think it's obvious by now that you need a dentist that has some compassion and some excitement about this because it is so serious. It is so serious. And uh, the orthodontist that I know that I communicate with online, they don't always agree. But now I know that there are some times, and you can help me out with this one, that Extracting the bicuspids is necessary. It may be rare, and I don't know when it would be necessary. Can you help me with that? I don't know when it would be necessary. To me, when you extract bicuspids, I mean, maybe two, 3% of the cases, um, but even in the Journal of Orthodontics, they still say extractions do not cost yeah. a day. That is nonsense. If yeah. that is nonsense to me, that is deafening someone for a much more difficult path in life or a short path of life. Do not extract teeth at all possible cost. Do not extract teeth. Let's if the earlier we can see children, I'm talking from infant to like three-year-old, four-year-old, the younger they are, the more malleable they are. And we can start tipping the right direction if they've gone the wrong direction, which let's face it, it's not a matter of will your child need orthodontic treatment of some sort. It's about when you need it and the earlier, the better. And by orthodontics, I'm not talking about just brackets. I'm talking about oral appliances that cause expansion, You know, whether it's in width or forward or both. If we can start nudging the kids' faces to develop right, the teeth come in aligned well. You know, my goal is, my dream is to get kids early enough that I never have to stick wires in their mouth again. That's my dream. <laughs> I have okay, so now look, looking back over the questions that that nice yeah. person asked us, how did we do? I hope we did great. But, you know, I want to, I want to read this one too. Where is it? Um, 
Oh, here. I got new retainers today hmm. that are causing my TMJD to flare badly. My bite also looks off. My teeth move very quickly and easily, though, so I have to wear it. Does that look right? Okay, so my first response is, <clears throat> why isn't this person, I'm glad they ask us, but why isn't this person asking their dentist? Because that's the responsibility when you go into this partnership with dentist to patient, that you have to have open dialogue and the doctor has to be open to speaking to you in a way that you understand that answers your questions. Because we know from personal experience, this the, this the tiniest bit, something's off, that it can be adjusted and it's no longer off. So that's, that's my first response to that question. Okay. And uh, okay. we're here to help them out. But still, it still goes back to the dentist who's doing the, the work. Correct. And they, you have to have, you have to be watching your P's and Q's. You got to watch out who you picked. And with regards to why do teeth shift so quickly um, when you're not wearing retainers? Because the root cause of the problem was never addressed. You know, why is it that some people never have to wear retainers? Why is it some adults have perfectly straight teeth in their 80s and 90 years of age? Because their tongue and the lips were in the right place. They had good resting oral posture. The tongue and the lips are the best orthodontics we can ever do, period. If you got- so, the right place Explain to that a little bit more because you have cheek muscles that push in. You got tongue muscles that push out. Mm -hmm. And homeostasis is when everything is balanced. Mm -hmm. So when these muscles are in homeostasis and they're not overreacting, they're not pushing out too much or pulling too much, then the teeth fit perfectly between the cheeks and the tongue. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Correct. What you said? Correct. So if the tongue is not up against the palate and the tongue sits low because a tongue tie is there that we've talked about before, or there are mouth breathers that we've talked about before, the tongue sits low, the cheeks will squish the face in and start making the jaw develop narrow and the lips will push the face in and make it flat. That's exactly what happens. So I mean, when you look, you look at my mouth, you see how wide this is called the buccal corridor. Mm -hmm. And then this is what you need instead of the teeth going in towards the tongue. Right. If you show a lot of gums, when you smile, whether it's above your teeth or on the sides of your cheek, your things are too narrow. They should have developed wider. You shouldn't show that much gum tissue when you smile. You develop flat, if that makes sense. Right. Yes. Look at the question again. Did, did we answer that question? I think we did. It was about retainers and what, you know, why is the teeth move so quickly? I hope so. Um, here's another one. Can TMJ cause ear pops? Not the popping sound that comes from the jaw. I mean, like air pressure pops, like driving through mountains. My ears have been popping a lot lately, just sitting at home. I've also been in a lot more pain than usual. Just wondering if they are connected. Well, we talked about the trigeminal nerve in one of the earliest podcasts, and trigeminal nerve can give you every symptom in the world. And I can't really answer that if it's the if it's the TMJ that's causing the air pressure or just an imbalance between the inner ear. Um, what's your idea on that? Uh, it's that I agree. This is a muddy type of situation. There could be a true inner ear eustachian tube issue that's going on. Right. And if it happens to be a joint or jaw positioning, a TMD issues, then usually um, it's because of certain ligaments that go from the mandible, the lower jaw to the inside the, the bones in the inner ear that can cause pressure issues. Like you're saying, it can cause ringing in the ears your fullness, your congestion, your pain. But that needs to be a diagnosis that's first ruled out, I think, by ear, nose, and throat doctor to make sure there is nothing, um, you know, like a tumor of some sort or a true eustachian tube issue. And then if there's nothing scary like that, I would seek people like me and our type of training to see if it's a jaw positioning issue. So it could be, it could go either way. Yeah, I would be, I would tell the patient, I don't know, this might be, you need to get some other check, need to go see ENT or something like this. And same thing with the ringing of the ears. I never did stand behind, you know, ringing ears that I was, by God, I was going to take care of it. Because there's just too many other things that cause ringing of the ears. 
So it's all well, with interconnected. It's all complicated. They're all crammed in together right there where the ear and the joint and the eustachian tube and the tensor tampening muscle and all of these things that can interact with each other and cause different kinds of symptoms. Correct. You will, What I will tell our listeners, though, is that if it is a TMD issue, when we're in that phase one orthotic phase, I tell all of our patients, if we are going for ear issues in the first month, you'll know that if it's your jaw position causing that or not. If we do yeah. not have resolution, we don't have to continue treatment if that's your chief complaint. You know, yeah, that's true. Back to the that's, true. that's the way I manage that. So people say, well, why is that? Well, and again, in this, this book, it shows joint position. And it shows the joint being pushed back towards the ear canal. And between that condyle and the ear canal is a bundle of nerves called the retrodiscal tissue. And if you push against those, it's going to hurt and it's going to feel like it's an earache. So there's just too many things within this complex that can be the problem. Right. So I just want to, again, reach out to our audience and just say we really appreciate your questions. And for those of you listening or watching, you should read through some of the comments. I don't want to bring those up, but there's so many desperate people out there that they're saying, you know, I'm about to give up hope because nobody can diagnose me correctly. And you can see the darkness and feel the darkness in some of these people's lives. And, um, you know, I want you to read those comments and be supportive because TMD, again, is a curable condition. It's just a condition and it needs to be diagnosed correctly. This is very fixable. And it's just about finding the right doctor to help you, whether it's me or somebody with our type of training, you know, just keep looking, don't give up hope. I agree totally, Pam. We're here to help you. That's what we're The only way we can help you is through education. Mm -hmm. So reach out to us, you know, um, let us know what questions you may have and what you want us to elaborate further on. And we will do our best to answer you, all right? Later. Bye-bye. Take care.